So back in March of this year, you know, those sweet, naive days of the early pandemic, I was scrolling through Facebook when a mutual friend of our speaker and I posted a link to a Facebook Live video with a comment that said something like, hey, see what Narita is up to. What Dr. Wilson, AKA Narita, was up to was exploring the depths of Ocean Canyons off of Western Australia and streaming the ROV footage live and unedited through the Schmidt Ocean Institute. I'd never seen anything like this before. Um, I mean, other than Jack Cousteau stuff, but that's all edited, right? Um, and, and it was mesmerizing. I, I became addicted. I watched their back catalog because I caught them halfway through their voyage. And then I set my notifications to go off for live feeds and became a real nerdy fanboy, um, suggesting t-shirts in honor of the Kitchen Brush of Science, AKA K-Boss and other reoccurring memes like Flocculent Matter and so on uh, that developed over the cruise journey. So imagine my delight when Dr. Wilson agreed to join us here tonight to talk about her research. Dr. Narita Wilson is a marine molecular biologist who received her bachelor's of science from University of Melbourne and her bachelor of science honors degree and PhD at University of Queensland. After two postdocs in the US at Auburn University, my alma mater and our hometown favorite, Scripps Institute of Oceanography. She returned to Australia and worked at the Australian Museum and now at the Western Australian Museum. So she went coast to coast from Sydney to Perth. Narita currently manages a molecular systematics unit and enjoys working across a broad range of organisms, although sea slugs remain her passion. Understandable, they're so awesome. Her research interests focus on understanding and describing the extent of biological diversity present on Earth and resolving the evolutionary relationships among those taxa. She is passionate about taxonomy and systematics as a foundational discipline that underpins biological science. And all I can say about that is, yeah, yeah, go for it. I'm completely agree. Narita has published over 90 peer-reviewed publications and has four species named after her. She's proud of her efforts to improve inclusivity and diversity in science. Narita has participated on 13 oceanographic expeditions and has acted as chief scientist on several of those. Her interests span marine environments and her work encompasses the tropics to the poles and from the shallow reefs to the deep sea. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Narita Wilson. Thank you very much. And uh, a quicker version of that would be like, I like everything all of the time. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna take you through a talk today uh, and I'll just flick over to my introductory slide, which oh, is not all that different. Let's see why that's not working. Hmm. Okay, host, um, I think I need some extra something. Mm, I can just use this. Okay, cool, here we are. Here's my introductory slide. And you can see I've dressed to match the occasion. I'm very into color and how it's used in nature as well. <laughs> uh, and as Michael mentioned, I'm based in Perth in Western Australia. Although I do feel like I'm still a part of the extended San Diego family. So I hope out there in the audience, there's some old friends and uh, uh, be a little holler out there for you guys. So I'm going to start the talk by placing you directly in the deep ocean, which is what this talk is going to be all about. So this schematic kind of shows you the various kinds of deep sea we might be talking about. Now, when I go out snorkeling in the mornings, I kind of think anything more than two or three metres starts feeling a bit deep. So for many people, this sort of like continental shelf area um, is the deep ocean. But as you can see from this, there's, you know, most of the planet is actually much, much, much deeper than that. And uh, our work, I've conveniently placed a red arrow here to show where most of our dives occurred on this expedition. And they're kind of at that part where the, the continental slope and the plane kind of meet. And so we begin most dives at the bottom of a canyon and work um, up upwards towards the surface. But of course, the part that sort of piques most people's imaginations are the very, very deepest trenches of the ocean, but they do form only a small component of the whole ocean. 
Having said that, they're pretty interesting. Uh, and it's interesting also to note that while we think about outer space, you know, being so crazily distant, the same number of people that have walked on the surface of the moon have now been to the Mariana Trench. And that uh, happened uh, or you know, in, in 2019 and 2020, um, there's been a number of people um, getting down there. So it's still a, a place of very active exploration. Okay, and talking of the Mariana Trench, I personally still think it's amazing. Now that we have all this incredible technology to help us explore the deep ocean, that one of the earliest expeditions you know, was measuring the depth of the ocean, just putting a line over the side of a ship with a weight on it. Like, yes, low tech, but so effective. And their measurements are actually pretty accurate. So uh, I can't imagine how long it took to sort of pull that line up again, but they did it twice just to be accurate and found this spot, you know, 10,900 metres deep. Um, and we know that now it's called the Challenger Deep. Uh, and it wasn't until 1960 that people were able to actually descend in a submersible to that spot and it took eight hours. Um, and I remember in, in 2012 when James Cameron kind of revisited that incredible feat, he went down twice as fast. So we, we're, we're getting there, we're, we're making it easier. And then as I mentioned more recently, another 10 people have been there. So sad to say some of the things they've discovered are that there are candy wrappers in that deepest part of the ocean and that some of the organisms have microplastics in them. So uh, unfortunately, one of those sort of myths about the area has gone and we know that our impact spreads far and wide and nowhere is um, unfortunately immune. So thinking right back to, you know, how we really started learning and understanding about our deep oceans, I, I was kind of um, interested to see there was this little argument, I suppose, that um, as I mentioned, how, how we used to measure the depth was through these sounding lines. And sometimes when those lines came up, they had animals sort of wrapped and entangled in them. And you can see the images on the uh, slide here of a basket star. Obviously you can tell which animals would get tangled up <laughs> on that kind of a line. So it was these kinds of animals. Um, and, you know, a few people had found, you know, worms and a jellyfish in, in deep parts, but there was a pretty influential guy that really claimed that nothing lived deeper than 550 metres. Um, but luckily, that was refuted fairly quickly by uh, another uh, influential scientist called SARS, who found many animals at 800 metres. And so that kind of put it away. But it's kind of funny, they're sort of arguing about, it's hard to imagine, you know, a time when we really didn't know what was down there. Um, anyway, post SARS, um, uh, you know, it sort of really opened the way for serious scientific investigation of the deep ocean and the Challenger expedition kicked off in the 1870s and that really, um, you know, went all around the world uh, for years and, uh, you know, really made quite a foundation for our understanding of the deep ocean. And yet, um, and, and certainly I'm ageing myself here quite a bit, um, you can see here on this slide that the, the kind of years that we discovered um, certain habitats in the deep sea, to me, don't seem all that long ago. And I'm not going to argue uh, with you about that. So in 1963, there was significant work on how wood piles formed a habitat. And it might seem a bit artificial, but you have to remember that, you know, for a long time, the world's forests were quite extensive and we didn't log them so heavily. And so lots of... Um, trees actually sort of fell down into rivers and got washed out into the oceans and eventually submerged and sank to the bottom. So it, it is actually a, a natural habit of ocean, as, as strange as it sounds. Um, and of course, who could forget the incredible uh, landmark discovery of hydrothermal vents um, with the submersible, submersible Alvin in 1975. So incredible places where superheated water is coming out and uh, as, as it um, touches seawater, it forms this sort of uh, precipitate that can build up into very magnificent looking chimneys um, and lots of endemic animals um, occurring at those regions. Methane seeps were found, you know, about 10 years later um, and they're a little, uh, can be just as dramatic in terms of supporting animals but tend to be a little more diffuse um, and, and don't have the sort of dramatic effect, so to speak, of, of the hydrothermal vents, but really interesting animals that live around there too. 
And then, of course, later on, um, whale falls and, and some really significant work for that happened um, around San Diego. And we've really taken a while to understand how quickly that big resource, once it falls to the bottom of the ocean, how it's utilised and, and all the kinds of animals that associate with that. So just to um, bring, you, bring you down under, so to speak, to Australia, um, in this little map over here, you can see this little blue dot. Uh, and this is the area that we were exploring. But where I am right now is down in Perth, down here. So um, kind of the backyard, but a, a little further away. <laughs> uh, and really, it was fairly recently that um, Geoscience Australia did kind of a, a desktop exercise and put together all of the bathymetry and all of the information we have around Australia to actually just kind of catalogue and count um, the canyons that we have. Uh, so it was, it was pretty unknown. And so the first pass counted about 713 canyons on our margin. I think that's up to around 750 odd now, um, but only a small component of those actually um, cut into that continental shelf. Um, and they're the ones that really have the most connection between shallow environments. And so biologically, they tend to be a little more interesting. Now this map here shows um, the set of canyons that are at the Midwest. And so this um, peninsula you see sitting out here is uh, the, the Cape Range National Park. So it's a very significant area. There's a big extensive golf system and a World Heritage Coral Reef in the shallows here. In fact, that black line there, I think more or less shows where that is. And so these particular canyons are sitting right up against there and you can see that they sort of peek in um, close to that edge. Not sure if it went all the way or not, well, with this, obviously with this representation here. But both of those canyons looked quite large and quite interesting, quite frankly. Um, we've only um, had the ability to uh, explore these areas fairly recently. So Australia uh, doesn't have uh, a scientific ROV accessible to its scientific community. And so we haven't been able to really appropriately explore and understand these areas at all. And so I think in 2015 was the first time um, a scientific um, sort of ROV expedition was mounted and they looked at a big canyon off Perth called the Perth Canyon. And so we were interested to um, move up a little bit and look at some of these sort of subtropical uh, East Indian Ocean um, areas, totally, totally unexplored up till now. And so, of course, how, how you do that, you need a ship that can stay in the one place while you put your ROV in the water. And it sounds fairly um, obvious, but, uh, you know, but a lot of the, the survey ships we have don't have that equipment. Um, and it is a very large investment to have um, a large ROV um, sort of manned and capable all the time. So we were lucky enough to partner with the Schmidt Ocean Institute and they brought their vessel, the RV Falcor, and their ROV Sebastian um, over to our waters for us to be able to use. Um, so that was a huge, that partnership was obviously a, a huge part of being able to make this happen. And uh, I mean, it, it's interesting because we do actually have quite a lot of ROVs used in the oil and gas industry. Um, and most of them tend to just have visual capabilities. And so you can see here at the front of this particular ROV, these amazing manipulator arms. Um, and, and that ability to pick up samples is obviously totally key for us who are interested in actual specimens for taxonomy. So that was really critical um, to making it happen. So I have this map here, which unfortunately looks a little bit low resolution. Um, I hope it comes through. So there's sort of all of the continents of the world are grey and then you have all of these spots all over the ocean showing where five different species and, and genera of black corals occur. And I'm using this just as an example. You could probably make this example map of many, many, many organisms. But what I wanted to point out was this giant gaping hole where there's zero observations off Western Australia. And it's not because we think that black corals don't exist here. In fact, there's a little inset there showing um, one of the ones we collected on our expedition. But 
it just goes to show that that whole area uh, is a huge knowledge gap. And obviously that coastline is very large, but you have to start somewhere. So we, we started with just two canyons and we hope to fill in maps such as these for many, many organisms. So uh, I've shown you this first image here, but what I probably didn't uh, point out is that that green kind of box that um, goes around some of them there actually indicates the extent of a Commonwealth marine park. So these significant canyons are actually protected, so to speak. We just don't know what's in there. Um, so it also made it particularly um, important to, to try and survey that biodiversity and just engage people with what they've actually protected. You know, you really need that buy-in from people to support and push back against any other influences that might threaten the status of that marine park. And so we picked these two big canyons. The top one is called Cape Range Canyon and the second one is called Cloats Canyon. We chose them for a number of reasons. Um, of course, they're the largest ones there, which is great. Um, they're adjacent to that biodiversity hotspot that I mentioned um, in the coral reef and, and on land. And there is uh, evidence to show that that adjacency between uh, terrestrial and marine hotspots of diversity is quite significant. So we thought, hey, probably a really good place to start looking if we want to find cool stuff. So um, that particular image there actually... Uh, shows like a heat map and there was some modelling work done that showed yeah, it's very likely that the Cape Range Canyon is a source of larval propagules, so a source um, of baby animals that, that filter down all through those other canyons that are more southerly to it. So we have a very strong um, north to south current called the Lewin Current um, and it seems that it's uh, it or associated uh, water masses are responsible for pushing some of those propagules further south. And as I mentioned, it is already protected. So half, half the work's done, we just need to know what's in there. And so, as I mentioned before, you know, doing this kind of work is, is quite an undertaking. And so obviously we needed to partner with someone that could provide the, the infrastructure we needed to do the work. Um, we had a series of, of curators uh, at the Western Australian Museum who have taxonomic expertise in those groups. And it's helpful to know, you know, we didn't know what overlap of fauna there might be. So it, it is helpful to have sort of like the local shallow water knowledge as well. Um, we had people from Curtin University come along to do complementary eDNA surveys. We had people from Geoscience Australia to look after the, the multi-bean mapping and also to, to do some sort of um, quantified transects. And then, of course, we had partners at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography uh, to assist with some of the taxonomic work. So um, we all went to see a merry band. <laughs> but that's another story. <laughs> so how, how this all works, right? So this, this ROV is deployed from the ROV Falcor um, off the back. So we use this big A-frame to pick it up and plop it in the water and then it goes down and, uh, and it does its thing. And it, it can take quite a while to sort of get that commute to the bottom. So um, I think the, the shallowest this ROV can work in is around 60 metres. Uh, obviously it has to pass through shallow waters, but for all of the systems to work um, and not get overheated, it actually needs, it's all designed and optimised around being quite cool water. Um, and its depth capability goes to about 4,500 metres. And we, we pushed it all the way. Like, why not? <laughs> what an opportunity. So, uh, so we have this sort of outside area where that's happening. But really the, the headquarters of what's going on, of course, is inside the control room. And you can see um, at the furthest end here, we have someone that was actually after that social media streaming, the live streaming, they push that out um, on YouTube and also Facebook. Uh, and then we have the two ROV pilots and then we have scientists running cameras and things. So it can get quite busy, um, but it's mesmerising. It's mesmerising even being inside that uh, HQ. So in the control room, I seem to be like climbing into the camera most of the time. <laughs> Maybe it's just my eyesight. Um, so what we originally proposed to do now, because... As you know, this is 2020. Um, so we originally proposed to do a lot of things and some of them were more difficult. 
Um, but the, the basis of our um, expedition was to carry out these biodiversity surveys and put all of that data out publicly through um, what we have, the Atlas of Living Australia. So all museum records get pushed out on a public platform where you can look up distributions and um, records of, of observations and of specimens. And any associated uh, genetic data would be put on the public portal GenBank. So we really wanted to make sure that what we found on this survey was really publicly available. And I feel like every minute of this trip was very public. So um, I think we achieved our goals. Um, the eDNA work, when those sequences are generated, they will be on another portal kind of part of GenBank. All of the bathymetry mapping is already available through the Oz Seabed portal. And the other part we wanted to do was to deploy these structures called autonomous reef monitoring structures or ARMS, um, which is much easier. So that's a standardised kind of piece of equipment that's been deployed all around the world, mostly in shallow reef systems. So um, it really just provides these little nooks and crannies for animals to hide and live in and, and, and also kind of settle on as well. But they're normal just settlement plates, almost a bit more like a bee hotel, but underwater. But anyway, no one's ever used them in the deep sea before. I think there's been one deployment um, but they had never been deployed in the um, sort of more abyssal area in the depths we were working at. So, so we wanted to put some of those out as a bit of a test. They'll have to stay out there a lot longer than you would normally do for a, for a shallow area though. And of course, as Michael mentioned, we were doing live streaming at some whole new level, which was like honestly a little bit terrifying in the beginning. Um, I don't normally do my science with everybody watching me. <laughs> um, it was a little bit strange. And so, you know, really trying to focus and make good decisions and communicate to other curators and people and also keep up a little diatribe of chatty, helpful <laughs> commentary. So sometimes it was probably a little less um, entertaining than others. But uh, but I really grew to love it, actually. And the, the online community that turned up every day and they all, you know, got to know each other as well, um, was really, really nice. So in the end, you were sort of coming to work in the morning with a, with a bunch of friends, which is always, you know, a fantastic feeling. So I, I, I'm a convert. I'm a convert. Um, we had a, a, a multimedia correspondent provided by the Schmidt Ocean Institute to help with the outreach components. And so they were putting things out on um, Twitter and Facebook and blogs and um, creating these little videos that really helped um, communicate what we'd found and what we're up to. Um, we did have a ship tour proposed. We wanted to do it in one of the um, areas in between Perth and the um, actual study site because, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, Western Australia is a really big place and Perth is the only kind of city there. And so unless you're coming to Perth as a kid, you don't really get the exposure to lots of fun things. So you, you know, you kind of feel like you're missing out a little bit. So we really wanted to, to do that in a regional area and, and, and share that experience, but that um, <clears throat> had to be toned back. And then we were going to do it um, at the port where we were taking off the day before we left. Um, obviously that was March when, yes, we were a little more naive to what was happening, but um, it, the COVID kind of clamp down was happening really, particularly for us right in the days leading up to our cruise. And so I think it had been detected in the eastern states of Australia and it was sort of through South Australia, it was sort of like, oh, my gosh, are we going to get away in time? So um, the public tours were actually uh, not cancelled but just curtailed. So people had to just walk um, along the dock and, and have sort of a guided tour of, what you can see from the dock, which is disappointing, but at least we could still do something. Um, and getting back to the things that we wanted to, to deliver, um, we really wanted to make sure that Parks Australia, which are responsible for managing that marine park, the Gascoigne Marine Park, um, had the information uh, that they needed in a way that they needed it. And so Geoscience Australia um, stepped up to, to do that communication. We're also in the process of producing an online guide of all of the animals that we found. So just to help other researchers um, understand if they've found the same thing or something different and, and just, you know, fun, fun read. <laughs> um, well, we also had um, plans to have um, Indigenous students and their teachers on board as well. 
Uh, we had a birth for an Indigenous ranger. Uh, we had a centre. All of these things basically got closed down. So we, we did manage to have a student come. The teacher couldn't, but we managed to have the first sort of unaccompanied high school student ever on a cruise on this ship. So there was a lot of um, crazy admin at the last minute. Um, we were planning to have a um, change out of the team halfway through the trip. And so that's where we were having a second, like the students would swap out and the curators would swap out. Um, and on that swap out day, we had a, a tour plan for all the Indigenous rangers in the area and the Marine Parks managers to kind of um, literally bring them on board and, and share what we were doing. But unfortunately, that all of course got cancelled. All of these things, we had all these uh, ship to shore school um, engagements organised, of course, no one was going to school by, the, <laughs> by that point. So it was a pretty crazy time. I think, you know, trying to carry out this work, which we had never done before, every day there was new administrative requirements or things we had to do and, and uh, different types of engagement. So although a lot of the schools then, <clears throat> you know, weren't there, uh, we these other types of things. So it, it certainly kept us very agile. Um, and I think we really... We're incredibly lucky because we we kind of pushed off um i think it was march 8 international women's day um and i think if we'd been 24 hours later we probably would have been cancelled as well so we managed to just step away in time and and we were you know a shit bubble absolutely everyone was healthy there was no issues um but uh the world you know, when, once you're on a ship, it is just like another world, um, your own little ecosystem. Um, and although we were very connected um, through the internet these days, it still was hard to imagine what was happening. Some of the news that we had day by day, it was, it was a very interesting time. But we knew also um, that this live streaming provided some really important opportunities to um, engage with people, help them through lockdowns and uh, give them somewhere else to be mentally, you know, um, so that was cool. So I'm going to just give you a little example, <clears throat> excuse me, of one of those. Well, it's a little, obviously a little shortened, but um, a little taste of what that live streaming was like. Welcome to the bottom of the sea floor. We're at 4,419 metres. We have a little welcoming committee here waiting for us today. I'm Dr. Nerida Wilson from the Western Australian Museum. And this is the last of our series of dives in the Cape Range Canyon. It's certainly a, a window into a, a different world than most of you are living in right now. So please enjoy the, the break and the serenity. I always find it amazing to think that no human eyes have actually looked at this piece of seafloor before. So you are seeing it uh, at the same moments that we are. And it's, I think it's really special. We are just absolutely in admiration of this beautiful glass sponge garden that we're watching here. It's beautiful. So this is one of the ophidiform fish. I hope you're enjoying this as much as we are here. The control room is loving this. is a, of a close up um, of those two canyons again. And this just shows the area that we were able to map with pretty high resolution um, bathymetry. Uh, and what's kind of interesting and neat about this is that there had been mapping in this area before, I think it was in 2008. And so being able to remap a canyon or an area within you know 10 to 12 years has not really been done uh, much before and so we were looking at how how you could use remapping as a monitoring tool of that area as well so that was pretty neat um, 
And you can see here that those that, that canyon head sort of reaches up onto the slope, but this lower one really, you know, there's some very small kind of uh, channels and gullies that lead upwards, but it's not so close. But in fact, the Cape Range Canyon, what we're able to determine was that there is actually a significant series of connections from that shelf area down the slope into the canyon. And so we were able to show that instead of being a blind canyon, it really um, does have connection with the shallow areas, which is cool. Uh, all those little dots, sorry, those black dots there show where we did a dive and also a quantitative transact um, looking at the biodiversity. So we were able to sort of do kind of quite a number of sites on either side of the canyon there. If the circle isn't filled in, we didn't do a transect there. We just did a, a biodiversity dive. And then when there was some bad weather, we zoomed over here and got out of the way and just did some plankton work while we waited for the weather to calm down. Um, in those same areas, looking at um, reflectivity. So this was something we were trying to understand, or we, I say we, really, I mean the geologists that were involved. Um, I'm talking about things I don't know about. Um, but you can see there that the, the colour between the two canyons is quite different. So that northern Cape Range Canyon has much more um, reflectance than the lower one. And that tells you that there's a difference um, in, in what's lying underneath of that canyon. Of course, there's loads of silt sitting on top, so it's not something you can see. Um, it's something that you have to sense. So we're able to carry out that kind of work um, we were lucky, of course, to find an absolute amazing amount of animals. Like I'm totally excited by just about everything, <laughs> even though sea slugs are my thing. Um, and so it was just a, a real honour to be able to see these animals, um, you know, ensure that we could take imagery of them with the 4K camera, but also then to take, you know, important close-up shots in the lab of other features that might not um, show up. And so I think that that high quality um, collection, so obviously prior to, to using ROVs, we're really just putting a trawl over the side. And, and so not only is that, you know, detrimental to the environment, it also doesn't really bring up the animals in the best condition possible. And so it was just such a treat um, to be able to be so selective and have such high quality specimens at the end of it. Okay, so I think I've got two more videos for you here. Sorry if there's a bit of repetition, but you know, the good stuff's just so fun. <laughs> also, our multimedia person had to leave halfway through the trip and get back to Scotland before they got locked out forever. So <laughs> they were doing a bit of it from the airport. <laughs> I think the thing to keep in mind about this is actually the average ocean depth is nearly 4,000 metres. So the vast area of the world is at that depth or greater. And we've barely begun to really discover what is down there at that depth. Welcome to the deep sea. I think for myself, the highlights are literally ever changing. So the most recent thing we've looked at and found, I'm so thrilled about, I can hardly believe. Then five minutes later, the next thing we find, I'm so thrilled about, I can hardly believe we have it. Visually, we found this incredible solitary hydroid, a relative of corals and sea anemones that stood well over a metre tall. The imagery of that, I think, will become the iconic uh, picture for the cruise. I think that's likely to be a new species. So we found some really spectacular worms that are pelagic, that are swimming worms. I'll be sequencing the DNA of them pretty quickly and establishing if they're new records for Western Australia or if they're new species, in which case we'll name them. So high excitement already, um, even before we can properly sit down. Uh, this is a faceless cusk eel. Please enjoy the footage of this amazing creature. New record for Western Australia. As far as I know, it's the deepest specimen of fish that's ever been taken from Western Australia. And certainly I've never seen any footage of this thing underwater from Australia. So to, to put all of those things together for this just one thing, let alone all of the other species that we're doing the same thing for, it's just fabulous. 
could imagine uh, maybe a hundred years ago you collected something. You didn't imagine a genetic revolution coming. You didn't imagine that, that it would have this entire new utility, you know, 50 odd years later. Um, and so we're just, we're going to imagine what can happen next with our collections. Hello? Hello. It's very easy to wrap. There's a flashing giant squid on the. Seriously. Um, it's super exciting, and I actually need to go now. <laughs> That's cool. Every moment is kind of new for me and I, yeah, I live for those and so it's a, an incredibly exciting trip because those moments just keep rolling out, uh, they don't stop. Being able to share those unique moments with all the people that are watching is actually really exciting for us as well. So I hope you're as excited as I am. It could be a long day of looking at rocks or it could be an incredibly exciting day. Either way, you'll have to stay tuned to find out what happens. In rushes Glenmore, our curator of fishes, to announce that there's a, like a large squid. For me, it captures this this cruise perfectly, which is you go out and you're expecting certain things, and all of a sudden you're just taken sideways, and you're now in the moment of discovery and doing something you never expected and seeing something you've never seen. So it's just magic. That, that was I've never done anything like that. Our goals for this expedition was to understand the biodiversity of Western Australia in a much deeper way. And, and this is because we haven't actually explored the deep ocean around that coastline very much at all. Simply by carrying out these surveys, we've already increased our knowledge hugely. Every day we're finding amazing critters, new records for Western Australia, new records for Australia, new things that we haven't seen before, and new species. So it's, um, it's just been an amazing experience. Good morning everyone and welcome to dive 342 of the Ningaloo Canyons expedition. I'm Dr Nerida Wilson from the Western Australian Museum and I will be narrating this morning's dive. This is a faceless cusk eel, um, which has generated quite a high level of excitement from our fish curator, Glenn Moore. Please enjoy the footage of this amazing creature. Our expedition aims to try and fill in some gaps in, in knowledge we have about biodiversity in the deep sea off Western Australia. Uh, it's very underexplored. We haven't had the opportunity to use an ROV such as Sebastian from the Schmidt Ocean Institute. Those eyes, uh, they're legacies from you know, millions of years of evolution. I hope you're enjoying his face as much as I am. I think he's just spectacular. No accounting for some taste. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I hope you got a feeling from that video just how um, it is mesmerising, right? I mean, you can have long periods where you don't see anything particularly exciting, but, you know, even areas where it's just sand and mud, there's animals living underneath or in tubes and things. There's always something there. So um, you got to see, of course, some of the highlights there and, and, and just how genuinely thrilled we were to be there and, and to be doing our jobs. And so, you know, after the dive, at the end of the day, the sub will come up with all of those samples on it. And then we would move into this area um, where the lab, you can see it's not all that big. Um, and so that's here's where we sort of carried out that photography and tissue sampling and registration of specimens, which we did on board there um, with the gang and uh, kept going into the night and then got up and did it all again the next day, which we didn't mind at all. <laughs> um, and the reason we often get asked, you know, you're trying to conserve these animals, you, you know, they're beautiful, why do you need to collect them? And it's a reasonable question to ask. Um, 
But really, for taxonomy, it's incredibly important to have um, specimens so you can actually compare them to other species because uh, sometimes those characters are very tiny, like the way, you know, the curve of a little hook or the number of little spines on something. And, and there's just no way to do that from imagery alone. And so it's critical that we have, um, you know, a couple of high quality specimens to be able to describe a species. Um, and you, then you get that sort of physical record of the fauna. It can be verified if someone thinks later on, no, no, I think that's the same as the thing we see off California. They can loan it from our museum and actually check it for themselves. And that's really how science needs to work, verifiable, recheckable. Um, and so those specimens are, are really important and, and, and we value them very highly. And so here's some images here inside our wet store. Um, it's a, it's a lovely facility and we make them all available um, as museums do. Although it's, again, a little more challenging at present for sending specimens around the world. Um, but, and the other side of it is we really try and strongly to make all of the data publicly available. We really want to push science and push understanding of the deep sea as much as possible. We're not just keeping it in our little corner of the world. So, um, but, it, but it is critical to have those specimens. And so for um, kind of this last part, I just asked some of the curators to, uh, to do a top pick. I wanted to share what they thought was the most exciting. And of course, <laughs> there was more than one pick, <laughs> as many picks as you can fit on a, a single slide here. But um, so uh, I, I know that the Moles curator, Lisa Kirkendale, um, you know, we, she normally works on bivalves and, and, you know, they're on the bottom. Uh, but one of the things that really excited us both on this trip was that, that commute through the blue water to get to the bottom. Um, and so, you know, obviously you, you have this sort of layer that normally um, houses plankton and larval animals and things like that. And then below that layer lurks the predators. Um, and so there was this particular zones where we'd encounter a large number of cephalopods or cephalopods or however you'd like it. Um, and so even though once we finished our work on the bottom, we still had to maintain people in the control room because we kept encountering these incredible animals. And so I know that was a huge highlight for her and me. What am I kidding? <laughs> um, and Glenn Moore, as you can tell from the videos, he was just thrilled with this faceless cusp, cusk. Ugh. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a pretty weird looking thing. Um, I think it's quite interesting to compare that, that little tiny little mouth, it's like a little trap door under here. Um, and this image, that's actually a pair of forceps that are opening the mouth so you can, can see that, but they just get cut off so it looks a bit weird. But um, you can see there that that's the sort of tiny little hole it has to eat. And I really, please no questions about what it eats, I have no idea, <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a very cool animal. For the crustacean curator, Andrew Hosey, um, he normally works on barnacles. And so uh, although he was thrilled um, to find this squat lobster, he was really much more thrilled when we discovered it was infested with this um, barnacle pa parasite, essentially. Um, so that, that grin is the grin of someone that's found a parasite. <laughs> There's always diversity, right, inside things. So that was pretty cool. Um, Again, you saw from the videos, this incredible giant hydroid was just, I mean, honestly, so beautiful. I can't, it, you know, and it's hard to tell the size from this kind of image, but that stalk um, is really about a metre, um, a bit longer, I think, but roughly a metre um, off the bottom. So it was really, it was giant. It's not just us getting carried away. Um, and you can see, if you're lucky, this little thing here, and here, these were actually little, um, I think they were copepods that were associated with that hydroid as well. We got them too. <laughs> um, so these giant hydroids had never been recorded from Australia before. Um, I believe there's one found off Ireland and another made in but not collected off Hawaii, I think. So anyway, that's work that's in progress. Um, super exciting and you can tell that some of these kinds of animals just wouldn't get collected if you use a dredge. That animal would just flop down on the bottom and flop back up again when you've passed by, if you know you even managed to come near it. So we saw a few of them on the trip, but not, not very common. So yeah, that was a, an absolutely stunning looking animal. I haven't really mentioned this one yet. Um, and this is a 
<clears throat> excuse me, a, a giant siphonophore that we came across again on that commute coming, coming back from work. We stumbled into a giant siphonophore, as you do. Um, and this creature was just astonishing, not only for its posture. You can see here it's spiralled. Um, it's in this flat spiral. That kind of, we're a bit above it here, so we're looking down on it. But it really was just this floating UFO. You know, it was just absolutely bizarre. And, you know, it caused a, a lot of controversy about how long it is. Um, the ROV pilots made a, a bit of a measurement uh, based on another system, not the visual system. Um, and, and there's been lots of perpetuation of guesses and things about 45 metres and things like that. I'm sorry, I don't know what that is in feet, but long, really big. And they thought it was probably the longest animal in the ocean because if you uncoil that, it's longer than blue whales and things. So we're in the process of trying to um, create a, a 3D model so we can actually measure it properly. But it's really technically challenging because as we were filming it, it's moving around up and down in the water column and a little bit this way. So it's really proving quite difficult, but we'll, we'll keep we'll keep going. Um, so that was pretty cool to just accidentally bump into. Um, and I think I really liked the, the demonstration of how, how the video was so significant. So this is a lanolarian. Um, it's a, a snail, it's got a shell inside there. Um, kind of looks like a boring purple snail to some people. I think it's beautiful. Um, but what was really, really neat was within, I think, the same dive, we actually found what it feeds on. And so we have footage of it feeding on these um, ascidians. And so that value is just incredible. Um, like, I don't know, normally when you just collect an animal, like chances of you finding out what it eats without sort of doing some sort of DNA survey on its stomach, which often doesn't work, um, is really rare. So this kind of ecological information even information about how animals are postured, you know, which way they face or how they hold themselves um, is really, really important. And finally, I couldn't finish without talking about the K-Boss, which Michael did mention. Um, I had this thought in my head, I guess, before the cruise that what happens if we come across something really big that we can't sort of easily collect or, or just an unusual shaped thing or, you know, how could we actually do something meaningful and I was thinking about sort of <laughs> before we did COVID tests using those little swabby things and kind of can we can we swab animals and at least get DNA and an image of something um, but it was we figured that the swabs are actually too difficult for the manipulator arms to hold on to and then I thought you know what <laughs> why not just try a kitchen brush I'm out there cleaning the ocean. And so we had no idea how well it would work really, but you can see here that um, a lot of these very um, large and agile uh, and inquisitive squids would, could come up and interact with the, um, the brush. And because it's quite stiff, they would leave behind uh, mucus and skin cells, which is doing forensics, you know, in the deep ocean. So um, we would then take that brush, drop it inside a a little container and seal it so no more kind of um, DNA is rushing through the water on it and then afterwards we would um, use a little um, I've forgotten the word but anyway just to, to you know use a little tool to collect that mucus and, and put it in ethanol and, and hope that we got enough DNA from that animal and just this week we actually um, did some PCR reactions and amplified um, uh, DNA from all of the cephalopods and all of the KBOS samples worked. Uh, we haven't got the sequences back yet, but um, it looks really promising. So we're super excited. And some of the other um, deep sea exploration ships like this have now adopted um, <laughs> this same technique, very high tech. I think I love it because it's that great um, contrast between this ridiculously high tech expensive thing holding like a dollar fifty brush. <laughs> um, so that's really neat. And uh, the other one of the other things I took my little, um, you know, the little head you have off your vacuum cleaner used to do the stairs, the little brushy. So I also took those and trying to use them as a way to collect another kind of thing. But anyway, we dropped one and now my stairs are really dirty and I'm in trouble with my partner because I just <laughs> took all of our vacuum components to the deep sea. Um, anyway, <laughs> so just wrapping up with our conservation outcome. So we did find some really interesting areas in Cape Range Canyon that had these glass sponge gardens and you saw a little bit of that footage. So glass sponges grow very, very slowly and are very fragile. 
and that particular area just seemed to be um, out of the way of things that were sort of falling down the canyon walls because that would just knock them off. And so it's a really, really special place. So that was really nice to be able to let marine parks know that they're there. And in Clerks Canyon, there were some really different kinds of soft coral areas, which we didn't see in Cape Range Canyon. So um, we're linking those a bit more strongly with the geomorphology um, and, and trying to understand if we can predict a bit better where those areas might be in other places. Finally, of course, because I run the molecular lab, I just want to sequence everything. And so that's really a strong part of um, helping with the identification of all of the animals that we found. Um, and those repeat multi-beam surveys, I forgot to mention before. Um, so we were able to detect quite significant continued erosion of the canyon headwall. So, so the canyon's sort of like eating its way up through that slope. Um, and also there was still a lot of deposition of sediment um, around the, the wall. So, so in some places there was like I think 200 metres of sediment in the last 12 years. So um, quite dynamic environments um, in that sense. So, yeah, really interesting information coming out of that. So trying to understand how that could be useful um, in trying to monitor and protect some of these areas. And so, yeah, I'll just... With our very socially distanced photo in the end, even though we didn't need to because we were all separated, but we thought we would send a nice message. Um, and yeah, I think, I don't think I have any, nope, no sneaky other slides. So I'm more than happy to take questions and I look forward to it. Thanks so much for being with us today. Wow, thanks so much, Narita. That was uh, incredible. I laughed out loud multiple times. Uh, uh, when you stumbled back from work one day to find a giant siphonophore, that was uh, one pool quote. And then yeah. I, could, I, I seriously laughed out loud when you were talking about the crustacean guy. That, that's the grin of someone who's found a parasite because I feel the same way when I'm looking at an insect and I find like a strepsipterin on it or some sort of weird like mite. I'm like, <laughs> exactly. Another all my dreams have come true. <laughs> So thank you for joining us uh, tonight and that was an incredible presentation.